Okay. Okay. Welcome everybody to uh, this session number 108 on the first uh, online uh, IAE conference on uh, topic wind and. Uh, also, I was officially forcing to share this session. I will directly hand over to Daniela Macedo, who will give the first presentation and also continue with sharing uh, since I have some other obligation, uh, which unfortunately cannot wait until after this session. Uh, so, uh, Daniela, uh, please okay. go on. I will share my screen and my presentation. Okay, can you see my screen? Okay. Yes. I'm just moving in. Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Daniela. Today I am presenting, um, I, I am a PhD student, sorry, I have to present myself first, at the University of Bed Interior in Portugal. Today I am presenting a paper which assesses the behavior of the electricity price, uh, considering the integration of the renewable energy sources, especially the wind power, uh, in the electricity system of the New Zealand. Our paper is still a working paper, which is entitled Has the Impact of Wind Power Production and Electricity Flow on the Electricity Price of the New Zealand. Uh, as we all know, electricity markets are worldwide facing a period of energy transition towards sustainable electricity systems. The integration of renewable energy sources, such as wind and solar photovoltaic, has intensified the volatility pronounced in electricity prices in most electricity markets. The most challenging for the, for the integration is because re the renewable energy sources production is highly intermittent and depends on weather conditions, and their produc production have nearly zero marginal costs. This this arises in other issues, which uh, is the increase of the requirements for flexible backup generation and uh, the electricity produced from wind power is being claimed of reducing the day ahead electricity price. This phenomenon, also known as the merit order effect, may render less profit to flexible generator generators, thus decreasing their willingness to invest in backup capacity, which is highly need to assure the reliability of electricity markets. Why did we decide to, to study the New Zealand electricity market? Uh, the New Zealand electricity market is a real time spot market, which is very different from the European electricity market, which is a day ahead, uh, a day ahead market. Besides that, it's an insular and self sufficient electricity system, and thus the New Zealand electricity market is isolated from highly interconnected, interconnected electricity markets. Therefore, this electricity market should be highly resilient against unexpected changes in the electricity supply and or in the electricity demand. The New Zealand operates under the nodal pricing regime or locational marginal pricing, which is also different from the European markets, which operates under the zonal pricing regime. Um, in the nodal pricing regime, the costs of half hourly transmission losses and congestion in lines are ref reflected in the final price, which contrary which, uh, to what is observed in the zonal pricing, only the congestion in the transmission lines are reflected in the price. Last but not the least, it is highly relevant to assess the merit of the effect in systems with, with substantial electricity autarky. We also study the, the impact of the electricity flow between nodes. Uh, once uh, the availability to store electricity in large scale is rather nil, and the electricity market of the New Zealand is divided in around 250 nodes. We've installed the interconnections between them. These uh, interconnections as, as main um, objective to share supplies and scarcity of renewable energy sources, reduce the price differences between the cross border countries and balance the overall system. Uh, the nodes we decided to study are the, uh, the ones with electricity production from wind power, namely the TWA, TWH, the BPE, the LTN, and NMA. 
I must notice that the north of the island has a um, production deficit. I mean, it, there is uh, high consumption and low production. Meanwhile, in the uh, south of the island, there is a high share of electricity production from either power and uh, most of the population lives in north, so the electricity consumption in the South Island is very low. So that the main goal of this research is to assess the impact of both the electricity production from wind power and electricity flow between nodes on the mean and volatility of the New Zealand's final electricity price. This paper analyses all early data of the New Zealand nodes with electricity production from wind power by estimating four different models for each node. The data was obtained from the New Zealand's Electricity Authority official website from the 1st January 2014 until the 3rd April of the current year. Uh, I, may, I must highlight that we decided to only study the zones with electricity consumption statistics. I mean, these four uh, nodes, I, zone is not zones, it's in nodes, sorry, uh, were not considered in our analysis because it was, they um, haven't uh, statistics for the electricity consumptions, consumption. The variables and their measures included in our database is the electricity final price, the reconciled demand, which is a proxy of the electricity consumption. This variable accounts for transmission losses, for uh, the verified electricity demand is not a forecast. It also includes electricity produced from wind power, grid imports and grid exports, which is the electricity flow between nodes. The stationary properties of variables were assessed through the Dickey Fuller generalized least square unit with tests. Then to identify possible structural breaks in the series, the Bay and Peron approach has been applied and for coherence proposes the unit root test with one structural break of Zivot and Andreas was calculated. The method uh, uh, that we decided to, to apply is a SARMAX charge. As we also know, the integration of intermittent renewable energy sources in electricity markets has increased the exposure of electricity systems to new risks and vulnerabilities. And the most stressful effects are the decrease of electricity price and increase of its volatility. So that when assessing the electricity price, it must be taken into account its inherent future such, such uh, the volatility clustering, mean reversion, outliers, and seasonality. The methodology um, with great potential to explain most of these characteristics is the SARMAX, the combination of a SARMAX with a GARCH approach. We analyzed the autocorrelation function and the partial autocorrelation function of the electricity price programs, and we found strong autocorrelation and a strong pattern of seasonality in the electricity price. Uh, considering the GRASH uh, preliminary uh, test, the results of the key autocorrelation and ARSH LEM test evidences also the presence of autocorrelation in residuals and uh, also the uh, heterosch elasticity in residuals. Considering our result, results, which are still a preliminary results, uh, the merit or the effect is found uh, in all nodes, where the highest and the lowest magnitude of the impact is found in the BPE node and the lowest in the TWH node. I must notice that the, this node is nearby uh, the city where one third of the population lives in New Zealand. So this result is uh, reasonably to occur because there's much more com competition and this magnitude uh, is expected. The highest and lowest magnitude of the impact of the electricity consumption, which also shows to be increasing the electricity price, which is also expected, is in the NMA node and in the TWH node. These results are also expected, as, as I was referring. Uh, in this node, there is high density of population, and in the NMI, which is 
located in the south of Ireland, is where no, not much population lives. Considering the results of the electricity inflow and outflow, it is in decreasing and increasing the electricity price. And uh, this result may be evidencing that the electricity flow between nodes seems to lead to the convergence of local electricity prices. The electricity produced from wind power reveals to positively and negatively impact the volatility of electricity price, which is uh, also expected. And the electricity inflow and outflow we will mostly do not influence the volatility of the electricity price. Regarding our conclusions, the main novelty of this research, which has been very challenging for us to study solar systems, um, we used to uh, study the European uh, electricity market, has been the assessment of the merit or the effect and the impact of the inflow and outflow on the mean and volatility of electricity price in New Zealand, which is in solar system. This study proves the merit of the effect from wind power in all four nodes. And as uh, we just uh, seen, the magnitude of this effect is found slightly higher in these two nodes, comparatively to uh, the South uh, Island node and the North Island node. Furthermore, and it's very interesting, this result is that there is evidence for the positive impact of the electricity inflow and the negative impact of the outflow on the electricity price. Uh, considering these results, electricity imports and exports can trigger two possible scenarios in a, an electricity market. I mean, when electricity connections get congested or unobstructed. Considering our first scenario, assuming that the electricity interconnections get congested, Electricity usually flows from a low electricity price node, which is the exported area, to a high electricity price node, which is an imported area. Due to the decoupling of these nodes because of congestion in transmission lines, electricity inflow will likely increase the electricity price in the imported nodes. Meanwhile, in second scenario, assuming that interconnections are unobstructed, the electricity is exported to neighboring nodes till electricity uh, prices are rarely equalized. This adjustment of the electricity prices will probably increase the electricity price in the exported node because the electricity usually flows from a low electricity price area to a, low, to a high electricity price area. While the electricity price of the imported node will possibly decrease. Our results uh, matches the conclusions of this scenario, which may suggest that the efficient management in the New Zealand electricity system, which could be potentially caused by the nodal pricing mechanism. This analysis proves that market integration and electricity exchange between nodes play a key role in explaining the formation of local or nodal electricity prices. Thank you very much for your attention. Does anyone have any other question? Any questions? Yes, I have a question. I raised just yes. my hand. <laughs> uh, so thanks for that interesting uh, talk. Uh, well, I, in fact, it's uh, one question and uh, uh, one comment where I might expand a bit longer, but uh, yeah, <laughs> it depends on uh, also whether we have the time and uh, whether others might be interested in asking questions. Uh, the, the question is on uh, your specification. Uh, did I get it right that you uh, uh, your dependent variables are uh, and explanatory variables are all in logs? Uh, uh, or... Yes, yes, sure, yes. So uh, it, uh, the coefficients are uh, elasticities. Elasticities, right, yes. Okay, now that uh, leads me to uh, and the comment that uh, I, I'm not, uh, not uh, I don't know what, uh, to what extent you are familiar with the uh, fundamental or bottom up models of electricity markets. Uh, be, uh, the merit order is, in fact, a, a supply stack which is piecewise uh, linear uh, in mm -hmm. our simple models. And I, I do, I'm doing a lot of work in, in that. Uh, but model. What, what model? Sorry, I, I couldn't hear. 
um, bottom-up models, uh, which okay. model uh, or engineering uh, ah, okay. uh, models uh, uh, or um, engineering economics models. So they, they model each generation technology uh, with uh, its variable cost, and then you get a merit order as uh, a stack of technologies okay. with uh, different variable costs. And in that kind of modeling, you can also uh, include uh, congestions. And okay. uh, in fact, uh, I've never seen, but uh, I'm not following uh, the literature uh, too closely. But uh, so the question is to you whether you are aware of research or have seen uh, uh, or see a possibility to do it yourself uh, to model uh, the congestions as a regime switch. Because in fact, as long as there is no congestion uh, in the bottom-up models, you would uh, expect that the prices equal uh, are the same between the nodes. And then uh, suddenly, when the line is fully loaded, uh, prices will diverge. But uh, changes in supply in one node will not affect uh, prices in, in the other mm -hmm. node. There is another econometric approach, which is uh, and techniques, which is very interesting, which is uh, the special econometrics, which is very used to uh, to study the exchange and the flows uh, between uh, market zones or market areas or systems. Yes. Okay, thank you. But you you haven't uh, tried that uh, yourself with electricity prices so far, or did you? Uh, make I've been the studying the electricity prices. But uh, also using spatial econometrics. It, it, it's the next task. <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> so I will be curious to hear what. We your... we are just we first start studying European electricity markets, North Pool, the Iberian market, and then uh, we want to study a very different market uh, with different pricing regimes, and then we uh, we. Um, choose the New Zealand because of its inherent features such as very it's a new solar system it's uh, very self-sufficient and uh, the pricing regime is very different it's the nodal regime and the European market it, it's the zonal and they have so it's very different and it's interesting to just compare the results thank you Does anyone have uh, an other question? Question? I, I have a question. Uh, yes. Thank you for an um, interesting and very good presentation. Um, I'm interested about interconnections. If you have price differences between these regions, uh, are they discussing making more interconnections, I mean, and, and who will pay for it? Uh, I mean, our uh, results. Uh, I can share my screen again. It, it is I. I understand it's very difficult for, to understand these conclusions. For me, it was very difficult to understand. Uh, here we have, oh, sorry. Okay. Here we have a negative impact of the electricity inflow. And here we have a positive impact. It means when the imported node, if the price is decreasing, uh, it's because there is no interconnections. There is no uh, congestion in lines, I mean, because usually the electricity flows from a low electricity price node to a high electricity price node. No. I, I understood the results, but if, ah, okay. if, if, but if this is the case, there could be a potential for a profitable investment in more interconnection lines. Mm -hmm. um, is this being discussed in your country and do you know how the system is to distribute the cost of an additional investment? But you suggest in case of congestion, right? Uh, I'm, I'm suggesting uh, building more electricity lines between oh, the different okay. nodes. It's, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. I understand. Yes, yeah. as, much as, more, as much as interconnection lines are increased, uh, the electricity uh, congestion will uh, uh, decrease and the convergence of electricity price will accrue. So it's better if uh, there are increased investments in interconnection lines. I'm not sure if I understand your question. No, Sorry. That's, that's, that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, 
then I have a small question. So the result yes. you have, is it the, the what's it the time steps? Is the time is the, uh, like, so what's the uh, granularity? Uh, is the, you know, how many minutes of this? Uh, pre, ah, it's uh, hourly. Yeah. Hourly, okay. Uh, do you build the result you shared there is other simultaneous results are, or is there any like a lead lag re relationship? Is it so uh, it's basically is the, 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 the contemporaneous result, right? So like, so the time is the dependent variable is time t and the independent variable yes, also time t, right? Yes, it's contemporaneous, yes, okay. yes it is. Yeah. Okay, does anyone uh, wants to question? Okay, so I think we can proceed for the next presentation. Um, if, uh, we still have time for questions, but uh, okay. So uh, we can proceed for the next presentation, which is entitled as Evaluating the Impact of Wind Generation on the Cost of Balancing Electricity Demand and Supply in the UK. Uh, Mew, Mew, I'm not sure if I'm spelling right the name, sorry. I invite you to start your presentation. Thank you. All right, I hope you can see my screen now, right? Uh, did I yes. Did I have my video on? Is, uh, somehow... Yes, we can see your, your presentation. I think you can start. I, I can but, activate uh, your video, no worries. Oh, okay, yeah, because I, okay, let me see. Good. Yes. So, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, thank you for everyone. Uh, so, uh, this paper is closely related to Daniela's paper. Uh, uh, it's also evaluating the wind, uh, but uh, here we look at uh, something uh, less important than what uh, she looked at the like the direct impact on the price, but we're more looking at the impact on the uh, balancing cost. The balancing cost mainly, mainly on the ancillary service part. So this is a uh, joint work, or maybe is the most of the, the period the work is done by Dilip. Uh, which he is in this today's session and is ready to answer any questions. Uh, it should be him to present because the conference only allows one person to present one paper. He has another paper to present. Uh, so that uh, put me on this hot spot. Uh, so if any questions, we can address to him. Now, <clears throat> so, uh, this is the outline. So the, a little bit on the motivation why we study this. Uh, obviously the wind power has a huge increase over the last decade or so, uh, partly because the UK is an island, uh, is a very windy. Uh, so over the last decade, uh, the uh, the, 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 the wind power increase has the, in terms of the installed capacity has, has more than quadrupled. So here are the numbers. Uh, let me see. So you, uh, if we look at this, uh, so the installed capacity has increased from about 2010, about a six uh, gigawatt to 2019, around 24. And as the total generation from on and offshore wind farms has uh, more than six times, increased more than six times. So from roughly 10 terawatt hour per year to more than 60 terawatt hour per year. Uh, so this is why the generation increased more than the wind capacity, the, 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 the capacity is per, probably because obviously it's because the utilization rate is increased and the more generation from the wind offshore farms, wind farms, the offshore has a higher utilization rate. So uh, meanwhile, uh, the balance, the cost of balancing, uh, particularly here we look at the cost of balancing in terms of ancillary service, later on I will tell you what ancillary service we look at it, uh, has also uh, increased, has more than tripled from 35 million to 108 million. 
Uh, so uh, the question here is we want to estimate uh, how much of this when uh, the cost of balancing increase is due to or can be attributed to the increase in the wind generation. So uh, now the literature, uh, Daniela has talked a lot about the, the merit order effect. Uh, we know uh, so wind because it's a uh, zero marginal cost is typically ECU. When you have more wind, the price would be tend to be lower. And we also know over the last uh, say decade or so, uh, when the, the levelized cost of the cost uh, uh, of installing the wind farms has decreased, uh, and that's sort of pushed the wind increase other than you know the sort of the policy dry, uh, drivers. Uh, but uh, there, I, the another impact is the effect is the intermittency effect because when the wind or solar uh, you cannot generate when the wind, uh, when it does not blow or the solar sun does not shine. Uh, therefore, you will need some sort of uh, backup resources or uh, additional ancillary services in terms of procurement, uh, the fast response, uh, operating reserves, and so on. And uh, so this is the main focus of this uh, paper. Uh, so uh, this is a scheme uh, of this uh, water type of uh, Balancing services, so the, so the ancillary services, is not directly the energy cost, but more about the ancillary service. Uh, so the ancillary service, most of this ancillary service, is centered around to meeting the uh, 50 uh, hertz, the frequency requirement. Uh, so when a, the frequency deviate uh, from 50 hertz, there will be some sort of uh, ancillary service will be uh, deployed. So there are different types of uh, ancillary services uh, from time, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, the, from one second to 30 minutes, that's all called frequency response. This frequency response, there are different, uh, within this frequency response, there are uh, some, some more granularity. Uh, the primary uh, response, frequency response, is uh, you need to be ready within 10 seconds and they need to last until uh, 20 seconds. Uh, so the secondary frequency response is something can be slightly uh, longer time. So you uh, get ready in 30 seconds and the last for up to 30 minutes. Then there are the fast reserve. The fast reserve is uh, getting ready uh, within two minutes and then sustained for 15 minutes. Uh, then the, the so-called store is a short, uh, I believe it is, stands for the short term operating reserve. This is from 20 minutes to two hours. So those are the more uh, directly addressing the uh, frequency issues. And then there are other Ancillary services, particularly like the constraint, is to uh, something is procured to specifically addressing some sort of uh, const, uh, the congestion issues. Uh, so the methodology, I do do think we need to spend too much time. Is a time series. Uh, is time series a model? Uh, is the observations are the monthly? The data, uh, the data frequency is monthly. Uh, there are, we look at uh, seven types of these ancillary services. Uh, it's, uh, you see these are the starting from the reactive power. Uh, so each of these uh, variable is called the R. The first R is the real, uh, real price. Uh, it's uh, deflated by the inflation. And then the, uh, the this is reactive power, this is the frequency response, and then the fast reserve short, short, uh, store is the short term operating reserve and, uh, and some others, the startup service and the constraint service. Uh, so we also look at the total. Uh, the units of measurement is measured in, uh, it's a monthly cost, but normalized by the megawatt hour. So, uh, so the expenditure, the total uh, expenditure to procure these services and then divided by the uh, total generation in that month. So it's the pounds per megawatt hour. 
that's the uh, environment. So this is the figure of these uh, seven types of ancillary services. As you can see uh, from uh, in the bottom, for most of this, like the reactive power frequency response, fast response store, and so on, are relatively stable. Uh, the constraint series has increased, uh, has increased quite dramatically, and also fluctuate. Uh, so uh, this is important. And later on, the result will specifically look at this constraint. Uh, so the these are the summary statistics. So one thing you notice, you might uh, wonder why there is a negative. The negative is the operating, the services providing operating reserves. And uh, sometimes you need to, uh, if they reduce the cost, then they uh, will pay back. Uh, a bunch of dependent variables, including the well, all different generations, coal, gas, and also the oil price and the gas price, uh, heating degree days, uh, cooling degree days, and then the wind and the solar. I think wind and solar are the key variables of interest. Uh, those are all the in terms of the generations. Uh, I'm so the. Uh, methodology is basically is a sort of the standard uh, error correction model is we use the ARDL autoregressive uh, autoregressive uh, regre autoregressive distributed lag. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to bother you with all these seven uh, estimates. Uh, so here is we only look at one. This is the total for the total expenditure for these uh, different ancillary services. Uh, you see, uh, I think it's uh, not, uh, this is the ECM. Uh, so the wind and also solar has a more uh, well has a, a sort of a more positive impact on the ancillary services. You see this oil, gas, coal typically has a lower, uh, has a, it sometimes is insignificant, sometimes is a negative impact, uh, but the wind and the solar has a higher, is more significant. I don't know why the solar has a, a lagged variable. Um, <clears throat> Then in the uh, co-integration model, because the error correction, uh, there is a co-integration relationship. This is more like a longer term relationship. Again, when and solar has a more positive, has a positive relationship and statistically significant. So that's the total, that's the big picture issue. Uh, we did a number of uh, test, residual uh, test uh, for the, because the constraint is the larger part, uh, a major part of this ancillary service is the constraint. Uh, you see this is the constraint service uh, for solar again, solar and wind is highly uh, significant. Also, is, uh, also the magnitude is important. Uh, here I think is the magnitude is more important. Yeah. Uh, the ECT is uh, is is uh, in the right direction. At least it's uh, sort of you know it's uh, between zero and one. It's negative, so it's uh, any deviation it will go back to the equilibrium. It's uh, that's the, uh, sort of referring. Uh, and the uh, okay, this is the long term correlation. Uh, the long term relationship wind has a long term relationship. The solar is not found to be statistically significant in this long run relationship. Uh, so uh, this is the sort of the like uh, the more takeaway result uh, for uh, wind for both wind and solar. Uh, wind uh, basically we take uh, you know take this estimated coefficients times this one standard deviation shock over our last uh, 12 months. So this is last 12 months, or last 12 months in the data is from, uh, I think it's September uh, 2018 to 
uh, August 2019. Uh, so that's uh, because the wind has increased over time, the, the installed capacity has increased. So we look at this one uh, standard deviation. This one standard deviation for wind is roughly one terawatt hour for a month. Uh, one terawatt hour just in terms of the magnitude is about like 20% of the total uh, total for the average uh, generation. Uh, so that one, uh, one terawatt hour change would increase the, uh, for in the short term, this shock is about one pound 16 cents uh, per megawatt hour. And uh, for the long term is 64 pence. So, uh, Again, uh, to give you a magnitude, so to interpret the result is to say this 1.16, uh, the like uh, the in that year, in the uh, 19 in the year of nine, 2019, the average electricity price on the wholesale electricity price is roughly 40 something, 43, 45. So this is about uh, three to uh, three percent. Uh, so three for, uh, in the short term. I don't know if we can add these two. Uh, my sense is probably we can't add these two. Uh, so if you add these two, will it be larger? Solar, solar, the coefficient is large, uh, but because the solar, the total generation level is lower, so the solar, uh, the solar has uh, uh, the one standard deviation is, a, I think it's a point. 1.5 terawatt hour for one month uh, is about almost a 60 pence increase uh, for in the short term. And uh, uh, long term is uh, something like the 27 cents a pence. Uh, so this is uh, what we did. Uh, essentially, uh, the impact went uh, on this uh, is uh, on the demand, uh, on the balancing, on the ancillary service. Uh, I guess is uh, if we take both of these together, both of wind and solar together in the short term impact is about 1.62 per megawatt hour. Uh, so for a one standard deviation change. Uh, so that's uh, if we put these two things together is roughly 4% of the uh, electricity uh, average, average wholesale price. Uh, so that's the, uh, that, that's basically that's the paper about. I think the if we say talk about say like the contribution lead to the literature, uh, I guess is there are not many studies uh, looking at this. Uh, you know, from uh, empirical studies, there are some studies looking at this more about the simulations doing these simulations. So we uh, actually take this into the data. What the data tells us. Uh, so. Uh, there could be some sort of policy impl implications because we uh, people always talk about you know, the levelized cost has decreased, uh, but what about the uh, cost of the sort of balancing and this sort of ancillary service? It's uh, not too substantial, but it's certainly not uh, negligible. Uh, I think I will stop here. There are some sort of uh, backup slides on what these things mean. Uh, if any, uh, so I would be happy to take any questions. Uh, Dilip is here. If uh, something I can't uh, answer it. Okay. Does anyone have uh, uh, questions? Or well, Dilip, you want to add anything? No, Sean. I was saying that I'll be happy to assist you in answering questions. Good. Thank you. Okay, I can start with uh, one comment or a question. Uh, I find your, your uh, research very interesting. And I, I was just thinking, uh, why does the increase of wind power production and uh, even the solar power production increases the balancing costs? I mean, uh, it would be interesting to uh, analyze different scenarios with increased electricity production and what are impacts and balancing costs. And the another scenario, the decreased of electricity production, and what are the impact on balancing costs? Um, that, that's only an idea, just to compare whether the balancing cost increases. Is it more expensive when there is high electricity production from wind power, or when there are low electricity production? 
uh, perhaps uh, studying the impact of wind power incidentally, incidentally or uh, the degree of volatility in electricity production, I don't know, or uh, it's just a comment uh, and I would like to hear your opinion. Um, Okay, uh, I think uh, I can start and then uh, Dilip because Dilip has spent more, much more time on uh, understanding what are these services, right? So these services, particularly uh, because so these services, uh, one is so many of these are about the frequency addressing frequency you know, issues. The, you know, you have more wind. Uh, there are more fluctuations. There's one is mm -hmm. and there's sort of it's a more really is more about the sort of the uh, intermittency because you have the uh, you when you have so the generation fluctuate there could be a frequency uh, you know uh, deviate away from this 50 hertz uh, then the uh, significant part of this is about the, con the constraint uh, I will uh, let Philip to uh, explain more about the constraint my understanding is uh, say you uh, if you want to accommodate more wind uh, so there will be some sort of it will uh, uh, in the local area, uh, there uh, you need to, uh, to, to, to uh, procure I mean, to procure some sort of uh, additional uh, backup. Whether it's the kind of backup or congestion management, uh, Dilip, you here you might come in about the constraint. Sometimes I'm a little bit confused whether the constraint is about the congestion. Yes, um, thank you so much, Sean. Uh, I would like to add to the uh, discussion by saying that uh, that's a good question. And the constant management involves basically uh, two kinds of uh, uh, services. Uh, basically, you in one, one part of the service is to, uh, you do not allow wind to come into the system when there is, no, there is a congestion in the transmission line. But since you have already kind of procured wind, you have to pay them certain amount to not kind of connect to the grid. That's the first point. The second point is then uh, to maintain the current and voltage level and current flows at different nodes, you need to bring in certain kind of generation, extra generation to, to, to balance the load and you have to pay them as well. So constant services are basically making payments to wind when, when they are not supplying as well as making payments to, for the additional services which we procure. Uh, to maintain the voltage levels as well as the current flow in the system. That's the that's that's my answer. But I would also like to say that a wind has um, a wind and solar um, uh, have uh, inherent property. Uh, being, I mean, the properties are that they are kind of typically more or less non-inertial in nature, and the entire grid. Uh, the old grid system, which is not a smart grid currently in UK, is, is inertial system. Now, more we deviate from inertial based system to non inertial based system, there is an inherent, what do we say? Uh, uh, the inertia keeps on decreasing. When I say the inertia keeps on decreasing, it means that when there is sudden change in load, uh, the, there is a chance that frequency will deviate from 50 hertz more often. And that is that has been the uh, opinion and as well uh, observation of national grid. So as we go from inertial system to non-inertial system by integrating wind and solar, there will be more procurement of constraint services or other uh, balancing services. Thank you. So just to add, the inner sure is generally is pr provided by the sort of what it is the uh, spinning uh, the rotating machines. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the you know the more traditional uh, coal or gas uh, these type of things. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyone more questions? More comments? Still have uh, we still on time? We can discuss a little bit more. Okay. Uh, can you please uh, stop? Sharing? Stop. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yes. Thank you. Okay. I think uh, we can proceed um, with the next presentation but we still have time. I don't know if you want to comment. Um, 
even uh, about my presentation, we are still on time. Okay. Maybe Just one comment end. from my side, yes. Dilip here. Uh, Sean and I were working on this, uh, is still working on if, if results improve, we'll be definitely uh, publishing those results, but we will be making this data available uh, for UK market after I have completed my studies, uh, PhD studies here. So the researchers can make good use of it as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, I think we can proceed with the next presentation and we have time at the end, we can uh, debate about all the presentations and uh, okay. So the next presentation is entitled as a commercial cost benefit analysis of Dover Bank Wind Farm. Uh, Peter, I invite you to start your presentation, please. So you can see my screen and- uh, Not yet. Not, not yet, I'll share it. Okay. So. Okay, now, uh, now we, can, we can see. Maybe, uh, okay, is any presentation mid? Okay, I'll just start. Yes, please. Yes. Thank you, Daniela. Um, yeah, this is a joint paper with my colleagues, Sindra and um, Magna, working at Petoro. Um, what we are doing here is to look at um, how uh, different um, investments in um, new these new renewables uh, affect the profitability on companies. Um, we, we don't see much commercial focus in the um, literature, uh, but to reach the targets for um, offshore windmills, we, we need to have the profitability in order for companies to be willing to invest. Um, and that has been very good the late last years. Um, um, capital markets have allocated a lot of capital to green industries, uh, partly explained by the interest rate being very low, because these are fairly set, certain investment. Um, this might change, so this is the kind of topics I will discuss. Uh, we, we will use a case, uh, the Doggerback wind farm. Uh, it's, it's the biggest wind farm in the world under construction. Uh, I should first emphasize what we have been funded by the Ministry of Petroleum and Energy in Norway, um, but it's been a purely research project and its conclusions are solely our own. Uh, this is the Dog Bank. Um, it's east of Yorkshire in U the UK. Um, it's under construction, uh, will be ready in a few years. Uh, it plans to supply 5% of the UK electricity production. So it's, it's, it's formidable. Uh, as you will be aware, what is being used is what is called contracts for difference, where the UK guarantees the price for the electricity for the first 15 years of production. Uh, the owners are Equinor, a Norwegian company, SS Renewables, UK company, uh, and any Italy. Uh, any bought into this project just recently. Uh, it's 9 million GGP expected CAPEX, uh, which is capital expenditure. Uh, it's a huge amount of money. And the plant capacity is 3.6 uh, gigawatts. Uh, what is particular about this project is not only the size, but it's how far from sea it's been located. It's uh, it's more than 130 kilometers offshore. Um, um, the previous, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure internationally, but the previous project in the UK that was farthest ashore was more like a 30 meters. So this is much farther ashore, which is makes it a pioneering project in that sense. Uh, what is special here is that the water depth is, is not much. It's shallow water, even if it's far from shore. So they don't have 
that complication, but they have um, they have longer distances for transmitting electricity, and they have longer uh, transport time when when doing uh, maintenance, etc. Uh, it started out as planned for 12 uh, megawatt uh, windmill uh, turbine generators, and it's now changed to 13 for the two first uh, sequences of the project, and maybe 14 for the last. Uh, we are fairly new to um, um, offshore uh, wind generation, so we put together um, a reference group and we've had a lot of inputs from the University of Aarhus where they are key specialists in this field and uh, we've had contact with ECNOR, the operations as a manager of that particular case and other industry experts and researchers. Um, to make um, an net present value analysis of an investment project, you typically need to make a few assumptions. There are some uh, information that we have access to and the others we have to make assumptions about. Um, uh, we find a lot of um, investment bank analysis out there. Um, there are things about them that we don't like. Um, and the main problem with them is that they are not transparent. They don't give out their assumptions. So. Uh, what we have been trying to do and uh, to do here is to trying to reconstruct the kind of assumptions that have been made in uh, when passing this investment decision. I'm not sure we share all of them, but none of them, um, none of us know for certain. These are estimate about future parameters. I think what the our paper contribution is that we show all the details involved in making these decisions, what are the input parameters, and we discuss the input parameters and everything is transparent for people to go into and check. And to my knowledge, this hasn't been done before. Uh, okay, the discount rate. Um, what we find in the finance uh, bank analysis is that they have a fixed a discount rate, we, we would say it would be better to have a, have it in two parts. Uh, you have a 15 year fixed price period where the UK government guarantees your price. We have put up a 5.9 nominal discount rate for that period. It's, it's fairly low because the price risk is not there. Um, when the 15 years are over, um, we go back to selling electricity into the market. Um, well, you are the experts of this. It's it's a very uncertain market. Um, and the, due to the higher risk, we, we need a higher uh, discount rate for that period. Uh, we assume the project duration is 25 years. The electricity price is something we know here because it's, um, it's a contract signed with the UK government after an auction, uh, so, so we know it. Um, the price is, um, is, is fairly low. Um, it's 45, around 45 into 20 terms. Um, um, GDP per megawatt hour. Um, this is much lower than the previous auction price a few years back. So it's more like 30% lower. So this project uh, is very ambitious. It is set out to reduce costs by some 30%. Um, analysts like DNV are, um, do not believe this is possible. Uh, some research articles say the same, even the UK industry department says this in their calculations says that this is not possible, but they make an exception that this is a very large project. So maybe the economies of scale will help. Researchers say uh, they can only do this by going down on the rate of return requirement. Um, <clears throat> um, Windmill, 
wind farms in the UK, they've had fairly good rate of returns in at least some of them in, in the early stages. We can see numbers like 9%. Um, the, this will be lower, um, and, but it, there will also be a very substantial cost uh, reduction I mean, we, we expect. Uh, capacity factor, that's a very important assumption. And we make a lot of discussion about that in the paper. I don't have time for that now. Um, this is uh, the cash flow of the project. There are, you start out negative with the investment period. Then you have 15 years of stable price. Um, well, we've assumed stable production, but you don't know that. <laughs> And, and then we have to make some assumptions about the prices for the last 10 years. Uh, um, the assumptions made here is, is actually very positive. And I, I would like your comments on these afterwards. We think to get this project profitable, you need to make some fairly positive assumption about the prices um, uh, later in the project. Uh, so, um, but that will be at a time where uh, electricity production by wind turbines has increased enormously in the UK. Uh, I'll say something more about the price assumptions we made. Uh, we just started out with the current prices as an estimate of the future prices. And I think that's the where we are being positive. Uh, we're not allowing for Daniela's merit order, of, order effect, uh, increased uh, wind turbine production, etc. So what we do but we try to do it partly because we say Denmark is a country with a lot more um, wind power penetration and they have a lower uh, electricity price than the UK. Um, so this supporting the merit order effect. So what we do, we, we make a mix of the Danish and the UK electricity prices to, to try to partially account for this. Uh, also, we multiply by what we denote an intermittency wind power discount, because uh, what we do, we start out here with the average electricity prices in Denmark and the UK. Uh, that, that was the price you would use if you had a steady electricity production, but that's not what you have. You, you have, uh, you have, um, <clears throat> you have a very unstable production and you have this effect called cannibalization that if a lot of wind turbines produce at the same time, you get a production, you get a price equal to zero. Um, in Denmark, that happens actually 14% of the days. So that implies that if you sell uh, wind turbine electricity in the market, you receive over the year, uh, a price that is lower on average than the average price in the market. So we put this discount to 10%. That may be modest. We, we don't know what this should be. If you have comments, we are mostly very interested in that. That, that could be a topic for research. But it's something we are working on. Um, okay, the findings of our uh, analysis is that we get an internal rate of return or or the return on the capital uh, at 5.6 nominal. Uh, you remember our uh, rate of return requirements. They were in two numbers, but we uh, this is not satisfied. So we get a negative net present value uh, and we get a payback time for 17 years. So it takes 17 years for getting the investment money back. Uh, at that time, you've got your money back, your 90 million GDP, but you haven't got any interest on it. So it takes a couple more years before you have ordinary interest on it. And, and then it takes more years. It would take more years to get a positive profit, but you don't reach it with our assumptions, uh, which are maybe be debatable. Uh, <clears throat> this is, if you see it from a UK perspective, um, a short-sighted view would be that this is good. Uh, we got this competition through the auctions, very aggressive bidding. Uh, we get cheap electricity by foreign capital. Uh, uh, 
Yes, in the short run, yes. But uh, when I read the BEIS documents, um, they, they actually say that these companies should have a nominal return on 8%, um, that they shouldn't um, be rewarded according to the very low uh, interest rate as of today, because these are projects with 25 years uh, horizon. horizon. Uh, so I think what their fear is that if some projects will be unsuccessful, it will be a bad reputation and will be difficult to raise more capital. Uh, so being too successful in the short run might, might hurt you in the long run. Uh, we put up the sensitivity on the rate of return. Uh, we see that if we change the investment cost, uh, that of course affects the rate of returns. The same with what we call this capacity factor. It says something about uh, at the how, how large fraction of the time will you have optimal production from the windmills. It has to do with the wind, etc. Uh, if you change the duration, of the project that of course affects the economics of it. Um, we've also said something about if you change the prices when you come to the market price and period, uh, if you take that down 20%, that many people would say would be reasonable, you, you would go down to 4.6 nominal return on this project. Or you could have changes in the operating cost. Um, the Finance um, companies, investment analysis, they have shown some nice figures with the even operating cost over time. Uh, we believe they will be increasing and that they will have to um, change parts of these uh, turbines. And uh, we think maybe the, there's a download on that, that cost side. Um, here I show the change in the rate of return with these um, inputs. And we see that capital investment is important uh, as well as the capacity factor. Um, <clears throat> uh, summing up, uh, I, I would just say that these um, sensitivities we appeared up here are not symmetric. So what, what we do here is we change one parameter at the time, keeping all the others constant. Um, but, uh, but here, it seems like we, we consider it just as likely as cost going up as going down. Uh, but the symmetry is, is not um, substantiated by research. Uh, research on cost in um, wind turbines is that you have an average cost overrun of 9.6. So, so it's not symmetric. You, you have it's more likely that you have an overrun than, than you get a saving. Um, previously, um, wind farm companies, they have benefited from uh, putting in uh, turbines with a higher capacity than or in the original plan. So one example is that they went from eight to 10 megawatts. That's an increase in 25%. Uh, then you need fewer turbines to get the same capacity. You need fewer cables, et cetera. It saves money. Uh, in this case, you go from 12 to 13, which is not 25%, it's more like eight. So, so this benefit is not as high. And you have uh, the challenge that you are being very far from shore. Uh, that might raise some issues. Uh, then you have this uh, electricity price after the 15 years guaranteed price. Um, I think most of the people we've been talking to think that we are being optimistic here, that it's um, the downside here is more likely than the upside. Uh, especially when you look at the UK, UK plants, they would like to increase offshore wind by 300% by 230 and 1000% by 250. Uh, we, see, we see a lot of plants in renewables. Um, when you see UK renewable plants, you, you should pay attention because they, they have delivered on their plans. So if you are an investor in offshore wind farms in the UK, you, you will have to account for this and try to figure out what the um, 
electricity prices will be after the state prices is abolished. Um, uh, one problem is also that neighboring problem countries increase capacity. So if you if you have interconnections, um, UK is an island, but they do have interconnections. Uh, but if, if your neighboring countries also have a lot of um, uh, wind turbines, that's um, not helping maybe so much. Uh, but the big issue here is, will demand increase at the same pace as production? Production is increasing a lot. Uh, will it take more time uh, to get more system flexibility or higher demand for hydrogen, et cetera? Will hydrogen need a low electricity price as a starter? I think that's the strategy for the UK, get a lot of windmills, get a low um, electricity price, generate new industry. The problem is that the investors in the windmills will not benefit from this. So there needs to be a balance. Um, okay, um, that's my presentation, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Yes. Uh, we are not hearing you. I forgot to uh, okay. put my uh, <laughs> microphone no closer to my mouth. <laughs> Uh, so thank you for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. You obviously touched upon a lot of things. Uh, so one clarification, you talked about the price, you know, after 20, 30, uh, 37, right? So after the fixed price period, uh, what's the exactly your price? Uh, some, is it something uh, average the Denmark and uh, uh, the, the Denmark and the, the UK price? Or is it because you have two figures, one is 38, another is 73 or something? Yes. Yes, um, I think maybe, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, maybe one uh, confusing thing is uh, when, when I put up the regulated prices, contract for difference prices, at one point they were in 212 prices, which is in the contract. Mm -hmm. And on the other slide, I had adjusted them for inflation to 2020 prices because uh, this contract is inflation adjusted. Uh, I see some contracts um, in this industry don't have inflation adjustment and inflation is now going up, causing enormous problems for the wind park owners. Uh, also, we have the issue that when you have a very large expansion in this industry, you will get a cost inflation higher than the general inflation. And even if your prices are adjusted for the general inflation, you, you might lose out. Uh, but is it, so the price afterwards is the whole, what are the is it the price after the 30, uh, 20, 30 Yes, we, we just took him, we just took a combination of the current UK prices and the current Danish prices. Okay. Uh, and the reason that we took in the Danish prices is that they have more wind power and they have more merit order effects, so they have lower right. electricity prices, which could be um, an indication of where the UK is heading. But so the afterwards, it will be higher than the fixed price, right? Because the current for difference is something 40, 45. I think the latest one was around 40, 40 pounds per megawatt hour. Yeah. Yes, and I think that's lower than the current UK price. Yes, yes, it's, yeah. much, it's lower, it is. Yeah. So yeah. because yeah. I noticed you have this 70 something, this, it seems quite high, the 70. Uh, yeah. So yeah, my sense yeah. is so 70 pounds is probably going to be too high, but uh, so uh, afterwards, uh, yeah, there are a lot of people talk about whether after this, uh, all these auctions, capacity auction capacity comes online, whether it's going to be lower than this, uh, you know, so this uh, the contract for different, whether they need to pay something. Another question is, if in your fixed cost, does your fixed cost include all these connection costs, you know, the cable and stuff like that? Yes, yes, we, we tried uh, in great detail to do that. I, I think the uh, financing companies, when they make these uh, investment appraisals, uh, they don't have all these costs in because it, it 
it's, it's, it takes a lot of time to find them. <laughs> we, we, and and we, we have indeed put in the time, and I think we have, uh, have it uh, all. Yes. Okay, good. good, good. But, but, these, but these are very complicated projects to analyze. And, and I think um, there are some investors out there that they don't have, it's, it's very important, very difficult for them to ascertain the reliability of this information. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in the research, it says there's a lot of data sources also that are not reliable. So um, one issue here is that when an, wind farms gives out these numbers, uh, they are typically selling off parts of their wind farm after a few years, so-called farm outs. So, yes. so what, what you're actually putting out is a sales prospect. So uh, th there is need for a critical assessment of data and we, we try to do that in, in the paper. Okay, thank, thank you. Yeah. Okay, and more questions? Uh, yes, Le Blanc, you. Uh... Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. Thank you. Uh, 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 thank you for your presentation. Uh, I had uh, two uh, questions and discussion. First, uh, do, do you think? I think there. Uh, I think I have an idea of the answer. But is there any difference between the contract for a difference? Uh, mechanism that is implemented in the UK and a basic feed-in tariff from the point of view of the firm, like the feed-in tariff being you get your electricity bought at a fixed price? Um, to me, I don't, I don't see the difference, no. <laughs> no, okay. Because, because the feed-in tariff also gives you uh, a guaranteed price, so yeah. I, I, th I think yeah. from a part of view of a company, it's the same. Okay, uh, and uh, was there was uh, my, my uh, it, it was about uh, prices you take for the uh, last part of the uh, uh, life of the power plant. Um, I don't know. Uh, I I I can't really say for sure whether what you considered like zero point nine uh, discount for uh, cannibalization effect is. Um, whether too high or too low, I would tend to think it's too low, but uh, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure. But it it will really depend on uh, on many many things. What is the electricity mix of the UK at this time? Uh, is there more interconnection, especially with? Uh, I think it's there, there are interconnection to be built with Norway, which may smooth out. The electricity price, which might have an effect on that. Uh, and also, I think offshore, like very large offshore plants, tend to have a very smoother uh, production profile than, uh, for example, onshore, onshore wind turbines. And this will tend to uh, lower the uh, cannibalization effect between, because you, you, have, you still have production when there is, even when there is low wind. Uh, but probably they, what you should observe would be something like when you reach your uh, when you reach levels of production close to 100% capacity factor, then that means you're in a high wind, uh, uh, strong wind period, and probably your price will be zero all these times uh, because you have a lot of wind in the UK, uh, wind power in the UK. So I don't know what would be the good a uh, good easy way to approximate that but but, but I, th I think in i think in germany maybe uh, wind power is like 45 percent of the total yeah uh, and i think the targets for the uk if you take them seriously are much higher yes yes <laughs> and i think that that would that would be a problem just think if you increased your wind production uh, in germany even more, I don't. I don't think that would go go off well. Yeah, but at the same time, in Germany, I think there is a lot of uh, mo most of it is onshore wind, and it's very very variable. Uh, when you look at the production profile, uh, the the whole production of German uh, German uh, German electricity, what what you see is that when wind uh, production goes up, prices go down dramatically, uh, even today. So, uh, yeah. but. 
it, would it be the same with a, in a system dominated by offshore wind with a more stable generation? And I, we can't really say that. Maybe you'd need to go deeper into simulation. What are exactly the electricity production profiles of such wind yes. turbines? Yes. Uh, I don't know if you've considered that. Yes, we, we, we've had um, on oil platforms, they, they have measurement of wind. Uh, yeah. So, so it would be possible to go that way. We would be trying trying out that, um, but it's yeah. um, but it's not it's not blowing all the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's it's a, it's a more as it's a more consistent wind, but it's uh, um, because with the capacity factor of fifty five, it's it's not a hundred. So, um, it's being sold into investors. That this is equivalent to base load, but it's not. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's yeah. Uh, there are there are days without wind, and and that's very fortunate for the wind farms, but because they need to go out there with boats and do the maintenance. <laughs> mm. so, yeah. Maybe uh, as a first approximation, there you could use some yeah. simulation from the, there is an open source tool uh, called uh, on the website called Renewable Ninja, where Re uh, Re what do you call it? Renewable Re Renewable dot Ninja, where dot, it's actually dot, what's that? that, that dot, and Ninja. Ninja, Ninja. Ninja. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So the the these two, what they do is they use weather historic weather data, and they have a model that simulates uh, wind production uh, for a specific geographical location uh, yes. using this weather data. So you you can get an idea, uh, first order idea of what could be the production profile of this power plant using this simulation, I think, and maybe look at the correlations with electricity prices. Uh, at the same time, that mm -hmm. could be a first uh, 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 first idea to thank, go thank deeper you. in this. Yeah. Yes, yes, very good. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Jenna, yes, you can ask your question. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Peter, uh, thank you so much for this uh, nice presentation and this uh, quite impressive. Um, I was thinking loudly about um, your your revenue streams. And I was thinking if you ever considered revenue streams from carbon credits that you probably might have, or, or, or have you thought about that stream? Excuse me, if I consider revenue streams from? From um, carbon credits that probably you might get. Uh, or, so, um... I will have to go look into that. I haven't seen any. Because probably uh, you would be displacing um, some of the fossil fuel based generations, yes. which might make you eligible to trade some credits in the UK trading scheme and um, probably in European trading scheme. And UK trading scheme for good news started with uh, uh, in January 2021, and the price was for one ton uh, of, of carbon dioxide, uh, the prices were around 50 pounds. So I believe, um, I, 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 my, my, my gut assumption is that at least 30 to 40 pounds uh, revenue stream could be added for per megawatt in your case. That's, that's my rough estimate because um, you, but that, needs you, to be, that, they, you, that needs to be looked uh, very very carefully. But do you uh, think that that credit? Do you think that is allocated to the power producer or to the company using electricity, changing from carbon to non-carbon? Um, basically, uh, um, it is 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 basically uh, both. It depends upon how you are going to structure it. Yes, it depends upon the structuring issues. Uh, I mean, these, these are the company issues as well. I mean, you, you probably could have some arrangements with companies who would like to reduce carbon. So you could have agreement with them to kind of have a revenue stream with them. Yes, yes. So thank you. I, I believe that that could improve the NPV. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Okay, we have one minute left for uh, last question. Then we have to proceed for the next presentation.
Okay, I think we can uh, uh, start uh, with the last presentation, uh, which is entitled as Long-Term Electricity Market Equilibria with St Stochastic Renewable Infeed and Storage. Christoph, I invite you to start your presentation, but Peter, could you please just uh, stop sharing your screen, please? So, so yes, um, I have to figure out how to do it. Uh, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, Why Peter is still trying? Okay. Uh, I, uh, as a, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. I just wondered whether I uh, uh, can share my screen, but now it seems possible again. Uh, as uh, announced earlier, I had to leave in between, but now I'm back. Uh, luckily. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I'm glad uh, to share here uh, with you my presentation on uh, long-term electricity market equilibria uh, with storage in the presence of stochastic renewable infeed. Uh, I see among uh, the participants uh, some uh, people I know and uh, who know me, and uh, I have to apologize towards them uh, because I had the intention to provide an updated uh, version of uh, this presentation, which uh, I uh, already uh, prepared some time ago, but then uh, I have been very busy over the last months uh, or so, and uh, including new responsibilities. So it's basically the same uh, that uh, at least some present in the audience might already have uh, heard. So uh, my apologies. Uh, but hopefully it's still uh, insightful for some of you. And uh, yeah, so uh, I have a, a lot of slides, so I try to go uh, too rapidly. Uh, I think it's clear we have increasing shares of renewables and, and now we uh, are facing uh, the challenge how uh, to move on towards uh, climate and neutrality, sorry. Okay. and. Uh, then the question is, uh, if we turn down all the uh, fossil generators, uh, how uh, do we provide backup in times when the wind does not uh, blow and the PV does not shine? And uh, this study contributes here more on a, a methodological level than by actually uh, uh, investigating with hard numbers uh, what contribution electricity storage may uh, have. So uh, this uh, slide lists some of the existing uh, literature and the different approaches uh, regarding uh, electricity storage. Uh, so there is a long tradition uh, in that uh, field, uh, but what has been missing so far uh, is, uh, with rare exceptions, uh, is the combination of a system perspective on the role of storage and the consideration of uncertainties in the long uh, term. Uh, one notable exception is the paper by uh, Joachim Geske and Richard Green, which here is cited as working paper, but uh, has been in the meantime uh, been published, if I remember well, uh, in the NRG journal, so the IEE uh, flagship publication. Um, so uh, the approach here is somewhat different from the one that uh, Geske and Green are following, but the research question is uh, similar. Uh, what is the optimal level of storage investment and operation in the presence of uncertainty? Because not only uh, wind is fluctuating, but we also do not know exactly when it will be blowing. And uh, then the question is uh, on a methodological or yeah, conceptual level, what drives uh, the value of storage? And uh, to investigate uh, these questions, uh, uh, the basic idea is to combine long-term equilibrium uh, with short-term uncertainty and to represent the short-term uncertainty through a Markov process in discrete uh, time and with discrete state representation of a mean reversion process. Uh, and uh, as we will see in a moment, uh, 
Yeah, I perhaps directly switch to this one. Uh, this slide shows the representation of uh, the Markov process. So uh, here we have time, uh, representative year, and we have here uh, states with high renewable infeed and states with low uh, new renewable infeeds. And then we have transition probabilities, uh, with, uh, conditional probabilities to uh, move from a state with a low in feed to another state with low in feed in the next time period, or sometimes you have very low in feed and then a storm is coming and you switch to very high in feed. Uh, so that's the setting that uh, is used to model uh, the renewable in feed. And uh, this is an exogenous process. Uh, also, you, uh, mankind has made a lot of progress, but we still cannot control wind. Uh, so it's exogenous to our model, but what we can control is the operation of the storage. And so uh, therefore I call residual demand, which is demand minus wind in feed minus uh, PV in feed as exogenous state variable and the storage filling level, which can be controlled, but which will also be dependent on how much wind has been around over the last uh, periods. That's the endogenous state variable. And long-term decision-making then means uh, we do not take the capacities of uh, storages and of conventional technologies as given, but uh, we uh, are looking for the welfare optimal or cost minimal uh, system. Uh, this coach. Okay, so that's uh, in a nutshell the explanation. On the following two slides, I have the maths, which I uh, don't want to go into the details, but uh, be happy to answer questions if there are any. So it's uh, the problem is formulated as a minimization of co uh, system cost, system cost including variable cost and investment cost. Uh, and decision variables include both the capacities and the production, and obviously also storage, charging, and discharging. And so we have several constraints uh, in each uh, modeled time segment. Uh, we want that uh, supply, including uh, storage discharge, uh, covers uh, demand plus uh, storage charging. And we have capacity constraints. We have the filling of uh, the uh, storage, and we ha have also constraints uh, on uh, both the maximum uh, filling level, which cannot in, uh, exceed uh, the volume of the storage, and we have uh, also under this uncertainty and the Markov process uh, a continuity constraint that in the next time step, T, our filling level is determined by uh, the filling level at the end of the previous time step, which is this Fnx uh, weighted with uh, probabilities and transition probabilities. And here we make a, a certain a discretization error. Uh, and uh, that's a bit where I have uh, continued to work on, but uh, have so far no uh, further results uh, uh, to present. Uh, because it's uh, yeah challenging to find a, a, a good uh, mathematical formulation. So I directly move on uh, to the stylized application, and then I uh, continue with a bit uh, larger uh, application, which is then uh, fitted to uh, the current German situation. So. Um, as I mentioned uh, in the introduction, the, one of the research questions is what drives storage investments? Uh, what is it depending on? And basically, uh, if we know that we have a lot of PV in feed uh, in, during daytime, but uh, zero in feed uh, in uh, nighttime, then these are deterministic variations. And uh, then obviously there is a case for storage is just leveling out uh, uh, the PV in feed or the net uh, demand variations between day and night. Uh, another uh, thing is if I know that uh, wind is uh, driving uh, is high today 
And this increases the probability that wind is also high tomorrow. That's what I call predictable stochastic variations that may impact also uh, the results uh, regarding the benefits and the role of storage. And we have also stochastic variations that are mean reverting. So after periods of uh, above average uh, uh, wind in feet, we will see periods with medium or low in feet. So it's not uh, in econometric terms, uh, uh, wind in feet is a stationary process. And uh, then we have uh, also, as uh, on the investment side, uh, in the question which generators are available and uh, what is the mix of high capex versus high opex technology so capex uh, that would be especially coal-fired units high opex that's uh, open cycle gas turbines and also uh, the value that we attribute to non-serve demand or lost load uh, that is also a driver how much the system uh, the economy is willing to spend on uh, storage to provide supply interruptions. Okay, so you see the uh, the setting includes still some uh, coal-fired technology. So uh, uh, for an update, I would uh, kick them out since uh, this Germany has uh, decided to uh, shut down all uh, coal-fired generation. Uh, also, the uh, CO2 price, which is in here, is uh, uh, compared to current levels rather moderate. Uh, the combination of a higher uh, CO2 price and uh, uh, yeah, uh, fluctuating uh, cheap generation might be sufficient to drive uh, coal out in the long term without an explicit regulatory uh, uh, determined phase out. So, um, next step for the specification is our uh, net demand so we say there is some uh, deterministic uh, variation in the demand we consider here one representative typical day and so we have a mean level and we have uh, uh, sinusoidal uh, variation so higher demand during daytime lower during uh, nighttime and we have a stochastic component which comes on top of the deterministic variation. Okay. I drop the exact specification to move on to the transition probabilities, which describe how likely is it when I'm currently in a high wind situation. So in the rows, we have the current situations. In the column, we have the situation in the next uh, uh, time step and roughly uh, parameterized according to observable time uh, constants, uh, we find from uh, one hour to a uh, one time step to the next, we have roughly 90% or even more probability to remain at the uh, same stochastic level. So mean reversion is happening in our model, but uh, at rather a low speed with the time constant is roughly three days. Uh, and so to investigate the role of the different drivers before, we investigate five cases. Uh, the first one is the one that I just explained. And then I take out the deterministic variation. So there is no day night pattern. Uh, then I uh, take out uh, the mean reversion. So uh, the extreme case here is that if wind uh, in solar is high at uh, the first time step, it will remain high over all the time period. Uh, that's the, uh, case uh, three. And case four is the opposite one. There, uh, there is no autocorrelation. If I have high wind in feet, in one time period, in the next time step, uh, it might be zero or uh, very low. Uh, and we will see in this specification of the stochastic uh, pattern has a considerable impact on uh, the role of uh, generation uh, of storage in the uh, mix. 
Yeah, and uh, case, case five is uh, yeah, to combine case two and case four. So we take off the deterministic variation, which drives storage usage, and we uh, in, in yet use uh, the full mean reversion, so no autocorrelation. And yeah, that's uh, what was the input. And here we have a table with uh, the capacity variables uh, for all technologies, uh, but let's just focus on the storage uh, part. And we see in our setting without deterministic variation, there is no world for storage. Storage is too expensive. You need too much storage to uh, cope with uh, these long periods of high wind, uh, which only gradually shift back to normal or uh, below normal levels. And the other uh, extreme is here the full mean reversion case, where we have a lot of uh, storage because, yeah, it's really, uh, I have a high probability that I can use a lot of wind in one period uh, to fill my storage and that I may use this storage content immediately in the following a period uh, to take uh, uh, to make use of it and uh, yeah so that's that uh, makes storage relatively rather profitable and all other cases are in between uh, if we take out a deterministic variation but we take the full mean that was our scenario five then we end up also in in between the 47 and, and the zero gigawatt and approximately at the same level of storage capacity as in the reference case where we have the deterministic variation between day and night and a slowly mean reverting uh, uh, process or stationary process for the stochastic component. And we see the same uh, result for uh, storage volume, the energy that is stored in the system. And here um, I have uh, had a, a specific look at the minimum and the maximum level uh, of the storage filling. And uh, we see there is quite some variation. And especially I'm interested in uh, how uh, large is the minimum level. So if in every time step uh, we keep some uh, energy in the storage, uh, I call this precautionary uh, storage uh, because it's uh, then meant to prevent against shocks of uh, the, uh, the next uh, of future stochastic fluctuations. And especially here in, in that case, we have no deterministic variation and each time step has a, a new identical stochastic. Uh, while then uh, we have only precautionary storage we do not use the storage to level out deterministic variations, but just to level out our shocks. Uh, yeah, and I've made a, a further uh, application still rather stylized, but uh, uh, calibrated on German time series. And I uh, still use one uh, representative day, but now 24 intervals and 10 net load levels and uh, key results in our uh, reference case is that we have 16 gigawatt of storage that's a bit more than we have actually in germany uh, where it's rather eight gigawatt including some uh, uh, storage capacities in luxembourg and also the storage fi uh, filling level is a bit higher uh, and we see here we have roughly 5% of minimum filling level. So the major part of uh, the storage uh, usage is to level out deterministic fluctuations, but still there is a certain role for uh, precautionary uh, storage. And that uh, increases obviously uh, along the same lines, uh, both with stronger variations in uh, net demand uh, stronger stochasticity and also uh, um, with the cost uh, terms. Okay, so this is my last slide. Uh, I hope I have been able to show you in the limited time that 
uh, long-term electricity market equilibrium, including short-term uncertainties, is a challenging uh, problem. Uh, and uh, there is a way to have an approximate uh, uh, representation as a linear program, which is uh, what at least people like me are most used to uh, apply. Uh, that could be uh, expanded uh, to uh, more realistic settings, including multi-annual expansion planning, but then it becomes really challenging, even as a LP problem, uh, to cope with it numerically. And as shown, and the profitability of the storage depends mainly on the deterministic variations uh, in net demand and on the mean mean reverting stochastic variations and the speed of the mean reversion. And precautionary storage is increasingly important. So uh, thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Sorry, I forgot to ask you about the vaccination. If it went well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everything went well. well. <laughs> and, Good. Good. Uh, okay. Uh, very Richard, I think you want to ask a question. Yes, thank you. Uh, so interesting stuff, Christoph, and you were correct in where the paper got published. Uh, so thanks for that. I was a bit surprised when you said that precautionary storage, you know, in your final case, you always had 68% storage uh, because yeah, that, that would almost, if, if every period you started with 68% and finished with 68%, that would imply you never actually used it and gave you no value, unless that was somehow coming out of the, I think it's the next slide that has the number, unless um, that was some. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think to explain it, uh, uh, we have to look at the maths. Uh, and in fact, what I'm uh, looking uh, here, uh, what I'm reporting is this level uh, at, uh, at the beginning of a uh, time period, which is a weighted right. average uh, of the uh, level at the end of the previous uh, time step. So indeed, uh, it's a, perhaps a bit uh, misleading um to say that uh, it's always the same level uh, but uh, i'm uh, not referring to this at the end of a time step before i do uh, this recombination uh, but i'm reporting uh, here the level uh, that we have uh, at the beginning of the time step right, because as i say i i i that when I saw that equation on that slide, I sort of started to get a little bit worried whether it would make you more willing to use storage if you knew the cases when you had to you know, use it in emerge use it all in an emergency. It was magically going to get refilled by the start of the next period because probably there have been some other states where it wasn't all used, and therefore you have a magic reserve appearing rather than I don't know how much harder it would be to explicitly keep track of the storage level as an extra index of your state. Well, uh, and this uh, storage level is, uh, yeah, uh, if you take the storage level as an uh, extra index, that uh, that's what I'm currently working on. And, um, and I think you are also aware that uh, this raises convexity issues uh, if you want to uh, formulate this oh, as a... Uh, yeah, F finding the equilibrium can be great fun. <laughs> uh, so I, I had the great fun. <laughs> oh, well, uh, it's, uh, yeah, hey. I tried several uh, stuff, uh, but uh, so now I'm quite confident I have a, a iterative approach, but it's not finalized. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Okay, we have one more question, Peter, please. Uh, thank you, Christoph, very interesting. Um, I wonder if I can, I can ask you a question a bit outside of your paper. Um, I'm studying the UK where they are planning an enormous expansion in offshore wind. Uh, do you think um, storage can keep track with this? Uh, well, um, 
the unpredictability of the fluctuations and uh, the longer periods of uh, low wind in feet pose a challenge to the economics of storage. It's feasible. We, uh, I know also uh, quite some studies for Germany who try to assess uh, the case of uh, uh, yeah, lying on storage. But especially for battery storage, it's uh, tricky uh, because uh, there uh, the storage volume is relatively expensive compared to the uh, storage uh, in feed uh, or uh, intake and out. Uh, that uh, discharge and charging capacity. And so uh, therefore people in Germany tend to say for, uh, we need some longer term uh, uh, storage uh, to fill what is sometimes called the dark cold doldrum when you have periods in winter with a low temperature, little wind and little uh, solar in feed periods that may last one week or two. And there we would then uh, need probably hydrogen to cope with the fluctuations and uh, because for hydrogen it's the opposite the storage capacity the volume is not that expensive but uh, uh, charging and discharging is quite expensive thank you okay we have another question but we are on time i'm not sure if we can uh, um, proceed with one uh, more question maybe asking the session host if it's possible I think it, it should be possible. Could be possible. Okay. Um, Mew, you can. Uh, um... oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll be very quick. So I'm not sure if it's uh, relevant to your uh, model, but uh, so, you know, the uh, battery uh, storage, there is an issue of the degeneration and the cycles, the number of cycles of this uh, electricity. You know, it can be charged and discharged, right? So does, would that affect your uh, result at all? I mean, is, is something in your consideration? Is, so I guess it probably will have some bearing on the cost issue, the capacity cost. Uh, yeah, uh, we haven't included uh, the uh, degradation of battery storage in that uh, study. We uh, have made uh, an, uh, other papers uh, where we try to include that. And my yeah, uh, feeling or uh, what I, I, got, I learned from those papers that it is there, but it is not that dramatic that it will have a major impact. And therefore, I decided not to include it in that study. OK, more questions? One last question. OK, thank you very much for your presentation. Very interesting presentation. It was a honor to uh, replace uh, Christopher's uh, share and uh, thank you very much once again and I hope to see you in next uh, conference and uh, enjoy the rest of the EAA conference. Thank you. Yeah, thanks also to all other presenters and sorry for not being able to join uh, with all presentations. Hope to see you, you in real life at some time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.